Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this special International Women's Day event, Choose to Challenge. We at the Female Lead want to focus on the challenges all around women at work. Uh, we're going to debate how we challenge the current structures and processes that hold women back in their careers. And we're going to explore ways to achieve equality, success and fulfillment. I'm Edwina Dunn. I'm founder of The Female Lead, and we've just launched some really new, exciting research called Breaking Free of the Unentitled Mindset. Our respected colleague, Dr. Terry Apter, led the research. She interviewed 70 professional women between the ages of 25 and 44 um, and conducted a really deep dive into the complex decisions involved in their careers and the world that they navigate. In this study, she uncovered both myths and persistent problems. And today, our expert panel will help us to explore potential solutions. So first, let me let us explain the title of our research, which is a psychological condition named the unentitled mindset. 20 years ago, Cambridge psychologist Dr. Terry Apter studied working women. Last year, we re-ran the study to see what had changed. The good news, some long-held beliefs were exploded by our research. Myth one, women don't want to seem too ambitious. Truth, women told us they're proud of their ambition. Myth two, new mothers stop caring about their careers. Truth, Kids or no kids, work is key to sense of self and meaning. Myth three, women are uncomfortable earning more than their partners. Truth, women value financial independence, which means personal power, but they want equal pay. Myth four, imposter syndrome holds women back. Truth, imposter syndrome can increase motivation and drive. Myth five, women don't take risks at work. Truth. Women will take risks for better conditions and control at work. So that's the positive news. And the negative? We found a lot of persistent problems that still block women's careers. One big issue that we discovered is something we're calling the unentitled mindset. This is the way that women are conditioned to feel less entitled than men at work, at home, after maternity leave, in all areas of their lives. To expect less, not to take up too much space, not to demand more. This creates a big entitlement gap between women and men, leading to big differences in pay rises, domestic chores, childcare, parental care and unpaid work that mainly falls on women's shoulders. And let's face it, the system can intentionally or inadvertently exploit and benefit from this entitlement gap, which widens when we factor in women from marginalised backgrounds and intersectionality. We're determined to change this and close the entitlement gap. Read the full report and find out more at thefemalelead.com. So, uh, joining us to talk about this, the unentitled mindset and what's holding women back mid-career, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Terry Apter, Cambridge University psychologist and author, Harriet Minter, journalist, broadcaster and author of Working From Home, um, Building a Career You Love When You're Not in the Office, and Vanessa Sanyoki, founder of Girls Talk, um, who's a real campaigner and wonderful mentor. And finally, uh, but definitely not least, Dulcie Swanston, business coach, HR expert and speaker. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all. And we'll all come back together again for the Q&A that's sent in um, from our audience. But first, if I may, let's talk to Dr. Terry Apter. And um, Terry, um, you talk to you know, diverse women about their lives and careers. Um, if you had to sum summarize the general mood what would that mood be? I would say it was confident and determined 
Um, and um, this, uh, this general attitude within this, you can see that a lot of the ways in which women are described in the media, which haven't changed in 25 years, are just no longer true. So uh, one thing is that uh, women are, it's supposed that women are uncomfortable seeing themselves as ambitious. Well, the women talked about themselves as ambitious. They use that word frequently and very proudly. Um, they were also at home being competitive. And one, um, one aspect of this was that they were very keen to earn at least, if not more than their husbands. This was the, um, this was a way of uh, showing interpersonal power and independence. Um, and another assumption is that once women become mothers, you know, all of their ambition will be hoovered up. They, uh, that will be their main identity. And of course, having a child was very important to a woman, but she still wanted to, to demonstrate her competence in the outside world. And then, as we saw in the um, animation, uh, another false assumption is that they're risk averse, uh, particularly when it comes to their careers. Well, the women top of their values uh, were um, facing challenges and contributing positively to their work environment, and they would take risks to do this. And another thing we hear an awful lot about um, is imposter syndrome. Now, this isn't quite a myth because 26% um, of our women did uh, describe a time at which they had experienced imposter syndrome. What is a myth is that imposter syndrome holds them back. In fact, it could motivate them. And they said, you know, I'm going to play to my strengths and I'll attend to my weaknesses, uh, but I'm not going to give up. So I think sometimes we worry unnecessarily about imposter syndrome. And all of this is the good news and the clear progress that women have made in the past 25, 30 years. And that in itself is important news, isn't it? It's really good to know that women are, you know, pressing forward and actually, you know, making some of those things that were true um, much less true today, which is, I think, encouraging. Well, it's and also important to be able to say, um, you know, when you see some things that don't work, you still want to be able to say some things have improved. It's, it, it's so important to distinguish that because otherwise you're very inefficient when it comes to solving the problems. And it's much more efficient to solve the problems if you know precisely what the persistent problems are. So that is really the big question, isn't it? Which is, oh, yeah. you know, what are the persistent problems? Because that's what we're facing right now. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're yeah. living up against right now. Yes. Okay, so the first most obvious and disturbing thing we found was the persistence of expectation bias. So someone has lower expectations of your commitment and your drive and your potential to be a leader. Um, it's no longer um, directed at someone just because she's a woman, mm -hmm. but it's likely to be directed towards someone who's going on or returning from maternity leave. So the women in our study said that as soon as they announced they were going on maternity leave, they became a different kind of person in the firm. They lost their um, place in the pecking order. They were no longer in line for pay increase or promotion. Sometimes the accounts, clients, responsibilities they had had were curtailed. And this was often presented in the guise of protectiveness. You know, um, you have enough on your plate. You have a lot to worry about now. Let's just see how things go. Uh, you know, no, no need to think about this now. So there was the guise of protectiveness, but the effect was to marginalize the women and harm their careers. And this was in stark contrast to the men who, when they became fathers, were seen as more likely to be driven and committed and more likely to be leaders and therefore would be granted uh, increased pay and promotion. 
And this wasn't noticed just by the women who experienced it themselves. This was noticed by all the women. So someone who didn't have children might say, well, can I really stay in this career if I want to have children? Or do I want to have children because I want to stay in this career? Older women who had children might say, I I've got to pretend I don't. I've got to act just as though I don't have them. And if I have to leave the office early for a kid-related thing, I'll, I'll, I'll give a more male-like excuse. And if for the women who did ask for flexibility because they had other demands, um, they experienced a long-term flexibility penalty. And some of them said that it could take between six and seven years for them on return to get back to the place they'd been before they went on um, maternity leave. And this then, <clears throat> they saw they didn't comply to the rigid template of a worker who can give everything to an employer uh, because there's someone else taking maternity leave for them. Um, but it wasn't only the you know nitty gritty of doing things it was also what they called the mental load so this involves the um, administration and organization of who needs to be where and when and if there's any kind of um, medical care where the information is where the appointments are what questions to ask in an appointment and then there's also just the uh, obvious stuff of, um, you know, who needs what in his or her school bag today, a yellow t-shirt, a gym kit, a signed form. And <clears throat> when they talked about exhaustion, they talked about the mental load. And the mental load wasn't, and the exhaustion wasn't, I need to sleep more. It was, um, I need space to breathe. I need time for my ideas to develop. And this is why at the beginning of the first lockdown, um, they found a little bit of relief, a little bit of reprieve. Uh, they didn't have to continue with what they called the military precision of daily life. And it affected both men and women. So a partner was more likely to be at home and available to see what had to be done. Um, but the final issue to flag, and the one that really puzzled us, and we had to think hard about what was going on, is what we call the unentitled mindset. And we saw that in action when the women were reluctant to engage in negotiations on their own behalf for increased pay and promotion and better conditions. And this was so puzzling because the women were very good at arguing for increased pay for their team, but somehow when it came to them, uh, they came up against the normally um, uh, biases that they could normally manage and you know, brush away, like um, you know, a woman shouldn't put herself forward, uh, someone won't like her if she asks for too much, you should be lucky to have this job. When it came to asking for their pay, I think the all of what they had learned about not being the desirable, entitled employee who has someone else going on maternity leave for him, someone else carrying the mental load, someone else asking for flexibility, that that sort of played into, I'm not that type of worker, and therefore I have um, and you know, I'm not sure I'm entitled to ask for this for myself. And of course, this is what we want to correct um, as a result of what we found. That's the big task we're facing. Brilliant. You know, as you say this, Terry, and thank you so much for, for summarizing that for us, it brings back memories for me of, you know, when I was working and, uh, you know, had young children uh, and someone very important saying to me, we start our meetings at 7.30 mm -hmm. on a Monday morning. And I just thought, well, that's game over because there's yeah. no way on earth I can mm -hmm. do that. So thank you. We will come back. We're going to debate these. But let's just press on with some more facts that you revealed and, and some, some more concepts that are really fundamental to this debate. 
I mean, essentially, the, uh, the unentitled mindset is most definitely a fascinating idea, one that we um, chose to highlight. And we've run yeah. um, a very large social campaign called the um, Close the Entitlement Gap. And the response has been really powerful and very extensive um, in these last few days. And in fact, we've had a wonderful and very uplifting post from Billie Jean King. Oh, wow. Let's share that, can we, Becky? Oh, there it is. Sorry. You see, you can tell I'm getting older because I'm looking right at it thinking, <laughs> there it is. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, you can see that the appetite from the audience is, you know, really huge for this. And I think it has, you know, resonated really, really strongly. So we're so excited that LinkedIn have chosen to partner us on Close the Entitlement Gap. And they've built on our research and they've gone on to find some really compelling insights that emphasize um, the, the entitlement gap. And, you know, what they've been able to share um, are, you know, the facts and figures that they've now collected across six different countries. You know, half women never nego negotiated a pay rise. 44% um, of women felt less entitled to promotions or increased pay. And a third of women, more than a third, experienced this entitlement gap around co career progression or pay increases. So, you know, we've also seen, you know, that, you know, men would apply for a new role if they felt that they had, you know, just 50% of the criteria required. Um, whereas, you know, only 27% of women would. More than two thirds of women say that they will come to a point where they will lower their career expectations. And this is the one, this is the figure to really listen to. The average women, woman expects to do this at the age of 33. And it's essentially the rationale is the mental load, planning, work-life balance that we hear so much about. And 40% of women agreed that their career had been set back and put on hold since the pandemic hit due to more responsibilities at home. And, you know, despite working practices and flexible working policies in place, the majority of women agree that having children has, in, in fact, impacted their career progression. So this is very real, it's very tangible. I now, if I may, want to come to you, Harriet, please. Um, she's, you know, Harriet, you've been writing about women's careers for many years. You started the Guardian's Women Leadership section. You've written a fabulous book, Working From Home, and How to Build a Career That You Love. So let's please um, well, we're showing the book there, which I think um, we Very all funny. need to grab a hold of. <laughs> um, Harriet, so we've seen from Terry that there's a flexibility penalty. And in your book, you write about negative perceptions of people who want to work flexibly. Yeah. Um, something you do when you want to sort of pause your career. Yeah. Really bad. How can organizations how can organizations change this perception? What advice can you give women? Well, so the first thing is from an organisational point of view, we've all had a year of seeing what actually goes on when people work flexibly. So if your organisation is still saying to you, um, well, we think that flexible working means you're not going to be as available or you're not going to get as much done or we know that you want flexibility in exchange for, um, you know, you can point out to them that actually you did a whole year of working flexibly with minimal impact. Um, so actually, we know that most businesses have, in fact, seen an increase in productivity over the past year because people have been working longer hours because we haven't had that much to do. Um, so there is there should really be no impact on the organization if somebody wants to work flexibly. However, that doesn't mean that it's not a what I would call a team game. So flexibility goes both ways. So you need your organization to flex to support you. That might mean that you also then have to flex to support your organization. 
And there are two things that I think are key here, which is one, thinking about it, thinking about structure as organization, team, and individual, and individual team and organization. So in a loop, going backwards. Um, so it's not just about what you want, it's about what you want, which works for the team, which works for the organization. And it's not just about what the organization work, wants or says that it wants, it does that work for the team and does it work for the individuals. And when we can actually design flexible working systems that way, what we then see actually is a feeling of reciprocity. And that tends to generate gratitude on both sides and it tends to generate better behavior than on both sides. So it means that actually you're less likely to get a manager being like, oh, she's only working three days a week. If actually you wanted to work two days a week, you've agreed to three, they feel like they've got something out of the negotiation and actually you were always happy going with three, but you said two to begin with just in case. So that level of reciprocity is really important. And then the other thing to remember is that flexibility inevitably means that you are not going to be having perfect squared off edges to your working life. What I mean by that is we see a lot of women becoming very disillusioned, particularly after they've had children and they go back to work and they go, OK, what I'm going to try and do is do, say, four days a week and one day of those at home which will mean i'll be at home for two days of the week so i'll have that day at home probably where i've got childcare, but i'm working but it means i can put the washing on i can you know clear out the dishwasher whatever and then i'll have one day at home with my child and then what happens is that those four days everyone goes well if you're working four days we don't need somebody to cover the fifth day you'll still be able to do that fifth day of work in four days so your four days stretch out they get even longer and then suddenly on the fifth day somebody's got an urgent meeting so you have to go in for that meeting and we get an increasing level of resentment so what i suggest to women is when you are thinking about your flexible working practices think about what they're going to look like when they flex to your benefit and when they flex to your disadvantage so and build that in and the best advice any woman ever gave me was she said when she was negotiating for her four day week she said to them i know you're going to say that you should only pay me for four days a week and i'm going to say to you that you should pay me for five mm -hmm. because i will still be doing five days work in those four days and that's going to mean that on the days where you do desperately need me to answer an email turn up to a meeting call a client on the fifth day i'm not going to feel bad that i'm doing it and that's, you know, that kind of understanding that actually there's going to be flex on both sides then really helps us to create a workplace that has the ability to support people when they need it and has the ability to allow people to lean in when that's necessary to. It sounds like such a sort of trusting position that, yeah. that generates this sort of warmth of feeling as well mm. that that kind of we all want from work, don't we? We all want to feel that we are trusted and that we're valued. And, you know, I mean, I mean is this the sort of third way that you, you start to explore, the third way of working? I mean, I think you know, it's really interesting you picked up on the word trust there because trust is a really big word that I talk about a lot in the book. And if you don't have trust as a value at the heart of your company, you're not going to be able to make flexible working work for you. You're just not, because you have to trust your employees to give you what you need. And your employees have to trust you to not be checking up on them, to not be penalizing them, to not be holding them to account on things you haven't told them about. The trust has to go both ways. And when we look at organizations that do build that level of trust in with their employees, what we see are really high retention rates, we see high productivity, we see high client satisfaction, because people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And so they go above and beyond. And they're happy to do so. So I'm not saying this is you get to create a culture, everyone works really, really hard. No, everyone is part of something they want to see succeed. And that for me is what creating a trusting relationship with your employees can really do and lots of people then say well what happens if we say suddenly everyone can work from home and then nobody does any work and i'm like well if you are employing people that you don't trust to do the work unless you are stood over them staring at them as they do it you shouldn't be employing that person you have unproductive uh you have unproductive employees, not because they're working from home, but because you have an unproductive employee. 
Now, maybe that's because as a person, they're a bit lazy. Maybe they just don't feel engaged in the work. Maybe they feel like they're not being given enough praise. Maybe they feel like they've tried really hard and nobody's helping them. Maybe they are scared that they're not doing well enough. Maybe they've got stuff going on at home that means that they can't give their all. It's your job to investigate that and discover, actually, is this a management problem and something we can support them with? Or is this just somebody who's going to be better off working somewhere else? And that's fine, too. Well, <coughs> forgive me. That, um, I think, is such an insightful um, position, understanding. And, and, and we have just a couple of minutes. Um, I need to, to move to Vanessa. But can you say anything about you know, this mental load that women inevitably, um, you know, f feel responsibility for because, you know, it, it's not doing the job so much as worrying that the jobs get done. What mm -hmm. can you tell us about that? So, I think there is, there's a couple of things in here that are really important. So the first is the piece of advice that Sheryl Sandberg family famously gave, which was the most important thing any woman can do for her career is be very, very picky about who she marries. And that is really true. Like if you are going into a life partnership with somebody and if you're having kids, even if you get divorced, you're still in that life partnership with them. Um, pick wisely. Pick the person that knows to make dinner when you've had a busy day, that knows where the supermarket is located, that understands how to iron a label onto children's clothing. Right. <laughs> pick somebody who gets that. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is there is a point where as women we have to set boundaries not just with other people but also with ourselves so we have to say do you know what if the school whatsapp group is making me feel like I'm a terrible mother I am opting out of the school whatsapp group and if that means that my kid goes to school one day without the right paper they go to school one day without the right paper it will give them something to talk to their therapist about when they're older right <laughs> Um, there is a point where we have to say, actually, we are not on this earth to be perfect people 100% of the time. We're on this earth to identify what's the stuff that we're really good at that really lights us up and how can we spend more time doing that? And as I said to one of my friends, when she had a very big job, she was having her first child, she had her first child and he had been diagnosed with very serious allergies, which meant that everything he ate, she was just worried about what's, you know, is this going to end up with him in hospital and she was going back to work and she said I'm just I'm exhausted I'm exhausted at the thought of everything that I have to think about when it comes to looking after this child and I said to her okay so you have to pick three things that you are going to be responsible for and then you say thank god I have a career I have ambition and I earn good money because I am going to throw some of that money at the problem and I am gonna hire somebody who can support me and I am gonna pay people to do this for me. And I am gonna go in and negotiate a really big salary increase when I go back to work with my boss because I need that money to support me and my child. Uh, and that's why we work. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I love it, Harriet. I mean, what you've suggested there feels like a breath of fresh air through all of this and I absolutely love it, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll come back. We'll come back. But let's just turn to Vanessa now. So, Vanessa, you're mentor, founder of Girls Talk London, which I've worked with before and I know is a fabulous organisation. And it's all about, you know, working with young women who are trying to break into the world of work. Um, we've talked about the unentitled mindset, mid-career level impacts. Um, how do you feel this mindset might affect women who are just starting out? Um, well, thanks for having me first, Edwina. Thank you so much. And um, as you mentioned, I work a lot with millennial women. So that's women who are aged 22 to 40 years of age, approximately. And it's those who are starting out and getting their first graduate role or maybe like their second professional role. And what I see so often is Many of the women in my community do not even realize at the offer stage that they are an asset early on in their career. And sometimes they don't really understand the value that, that they're going to bring to the business and what they are worth. And one of the things I always tell women in my community is you should really focus on negotiating your package at the offer stage, because we typically think about negotiating pay in the promotion process. So once I'm in, I'm here for a year or so, I can negotiate and, um, you know, pay. But I think it's really 
important, it will make a difference for those starting out that you negotiate at the offer stage. Because what we'll find is then um, this can mean the difference of women starting out their careers in a lower or higher band or grade. So when promotion time comes, you're not trying to really sort of sell yourself to go two grades up. Maybe it's only one grade up, for example. And I always say to women, you know, think about the package. So as you as we've seen in the research, it's about yes, the benefits, but also your working pattern, training, travel allowance, really think about all of those things. And just to start owning your career from the beginning, because what I find that if you don't, it will affect your career path. And I think also with women starting out, if we're seeing that there are a lack of women in senior leadership or a lack of visible women who, you know, Harriet spoke a lot about working flexibly or women who have successful careers who are parents. And if we see as women starting out that they're not advancing up the career ladder, it will be really demotivating to women starting out. And it can affect things like their confidence, how productive they are, how open they are and how much trust they have in employers with their careers. Well, I think that's fabulous advice. And I mean, it makes sense, which is if you don't start in the right place, it's even harder to move up the ladder. I yeah. really like that. Yeah. Now, perhaps you can also help with, you know, how can you advise or suggest organisations improve what appears as sadly a double impact of unentitled mindset when it comes to intersectionality? Yeah, I mean, I will touch on, in terms of when we talk about the intersection and the double impact, um, I guess for minority groups, it can be race, ethnicity, disability or sexual orientation. But I'll talk about it from what I know in terms of best through my work and just being a woman of colour, a black woman specifically. And I just feel that, you know, when we sort of look at it, the data is really key, key here. So everything that we've had in the in the research, but also just externally from stats, you know, there's been you know, some research done by the FT, for example, um, where they were interviewing senior um, leaders, executives, and some of them were suggesting that they felt black women were unqualified and lacked the drive. And they didn't believe that there was a quality of you know, qualified and talented black women in corporate Britain. And then if you look at the figures, um, the double impact of the unentitled mindset um, and also all of the other sort of pain points that we've seen in the research for black women, we face um, barriers in pay. So we're paid less than white men and white women um, in the US and the UK. And then also when you look at leadership, so senior leadership, you know, we know the FTSE 100 has no um, black female executives. So that's chairs, CEOs and CFOs. In the US, we've now got two black female CEOs out of the Fortune 500. So I think, you know, these stats, are, you know, really show that there is a, significant barrier when it comes to pay and progression that intensifies more so when you look at race and ethnicity and you know women of color um black women you know we aren't you know we are at very low levels in terms of senior leadership and so what i would advise to businesses is you really need to you know as a as a business we need to ensure that these women who face additional barriers in the workplace um, are able to uh, progress and are paid, you know, appropriately. And, you know, we've seen that businesses have embraced the voluntary targets that have uh, around gender diversity. And I think they need to replicate this for voluntary targets for women that make, meet that intersection. So for women of colour or women, um, you know, who have disabilities, for example, for example. And it's around making executives accountable for this and and also thinking about the career path so for the double impact for women who face the double impact and um, it's about ensuring that um, women have career and growth development opportunities so things that can really sort of um, add value is around mentoring and coaching and the most sort of major thing as well as around sponsorship so making sure that you you know sponsorship is really embedded in your organization for example for women who do face that double impact it's around having a senior sponsor really does make a difference in terms of giving you visibility getting you to work on a high profile project for example and um, and also 
giving us that flexibility. If you've got somebody in your corner, when you're thinking about balancing work commitments or going for a promotion or pay rise, you've got that sponsor who can say, actually, you know, yes, Vanessa should, you know, really get this, you know, these this pay, this promotion, because, you know, I'm going to advocate for her. So it's really about having an advocate. And then also I say to, um, to organisations as well, um, to like review your policies, your succession plans, also your redundancy list, transformation list, and see, you know, collect the data and see, you know, how many women do we have on these lists? How many um, ethnic minority women do we have? And sort of making sure that, you know, you're being conscious that it's not really going to affect a certain demographic. So there are, there are lots of things, but there are, are a few. <laughs> No, it's wonderful to hear you talk with with such passion and, and clarity. And I mean, I suppose my final question, you know, perhaps in brief, is how do you make sure that the young women you meet who perhaps don't see as many role models, as many people in leadership roles, how do you make sure they, they stay on this self-belief and they stay positive through all of this? Because it can be a bit grim looking out and up and not seeing. You know, we talk about you can't be what you can't see, but how do you keep them really motivated and positive? Yeah, and I mean, I think in terms of just having the the motivation, it's really, I think what Harriet touched on, you know, before, it's really thinking about sort of, you know, what kind of employer do you want to work for? What kind of career do you, do you want? And I think it's around sort of tapping into community. So um, looking at where you can get your support network and sort of sort of how you can access, you know, role models, people who, you know, who look like you, people who you can look up to and et cetera. But I do feel that... Um, for women, even look, just thinking about the research um, and when Dr. Terry was talking about it and it was great to see, you know, that yes, as women, we are still, you know, we are very ambitious. We want to have family and we want to have fulfilling careers. But I do feel that, you know, the onus really should be also on businesses really making sure that the, the playing field is is leveled out, especially for women in early on in their careers. Because I think for me, what I worry about is, um, and what I see a lot, is I've seen a lot of women, and particularly black women, they will um, enter the corporate um, world, and after maybe sort of 18 months or two years, they will leave to either start their own businesses because they feel that they don't trust employers of their career, and they feel that they'd rather sort of you know take their own career in their own hands to have that flexibility. And then what's really going to happen is there's going to be a you know a massive skills gap with employers. So I would just say it's really important to you know, take note of all the advice that's been shared, especially from Harriet. I was even taking notes around, you know, how to negotiate your pay and promotion and really um, advocate for your, you know, for yourself. Well, you're a fabulous role model, Vanessa, and I know a lot of people look to you and a lot of people ask for your advice. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we'll come back in just a couple of minutes for, for, for more Q&A. Um, so can I please turn to Dulcie now? So, Dulcie, HR director, you were in the hot seat for many years. I think you're still in the hot seat as coach, advisor. Let me ask you a question. So, we've heard the problems. What do you think are the key changes that businesses need to make to improve the situation for women? Because it's been years. We know it's not been a level playing field. Why now? Why can we do it now? Oh, you're on mute, I think, Dulcie, or it's just me. There we go, I've done it. Um, there you go. One of the things I've done in preparation for today is, is I've been to speak to lots of my HRD contacts who are still doing the job. I, I help to mentor people into those roles and also CEOs, both men and women. And do you know what? The overriding thing that people told me was you need female leaders represented, not just one. You need numbers at that senior level so that's really important but what was really interesting is there wasn't very much support certainly with the people I spoke to about positive discrimination by itself 
because some people felt as though that led to um, confirmation bias. So actually, if somebody wasn't competent in the job, it led people to back up their own biases about women, but also it increased that sense of imposter syndrome. So have I just got this job because I'm the token woman? So I think it's not hard to find exceptionally competent women at all, but just make sure that your, you know, your processes are robust. And interestingly, it goes back to what Vanessa says, is that sometimes we can have um, selection processes that actually are unintentionally unfair. So some of the general cognitive ability tests that we use, actually the subsets show that women test less well in those, even if they are highly competent, and also the same for BME and neurodiverse candidates. So I think there's some really practical things. And a, a, a stat I loved when I did a bit of reading was that blind auditions increase the chances of female musicians being hired by 46%. So for me, this just emphasizes just how much of this bias we have that we're not we're not meaning to have, but it's there. And it and do you know what? It's embedded a long time before our careers begin. So by the time we're in the workplace and, and we're talking about sort of this this age range at mid-range, is that some researchers actually believe that by the time we are 30. 90% and you know that that number's up for grabs but you know some people believe it's as much as that that 90% of what we think feel and say is recycled so actually once we get to uh, um sorry can you see me okay there um, uh, we lost your sound for a minute but you're back fully okay back. yeah so um you know we have to be really careful that this stuff has, is, is around us from, from birth, really. And that actually some of the ways in which we, we find ourselves being, being biased are really unintentional. So we, we can't, in effect, look at organisations on their own. We have to look at society and we have to look at, um, you know, generationally what we're doing. But we have to be really careful about the unintentional bias that's in some of our selection processes, for sure. And I think you offer a very good reminder, um, Dulcie, of the fact that we all are biased in some way. And it's not something we can just say, that's other people. They, they are the problem, not me. This is the time where we all need to look at what we do ourselves. Um, 100%. That's very important. I'm hearing just a little bit of static, but I hope that's just me. And I'm going to continue unless okay. someone um, tells me otherwise. So um, so you've seen examples of, um, no, have you seen examples? Not you have. Have you seen examples of organisations who've put some policies in place that remove some of the barriers? And if you have do you feel that they have the potential to work and are working are there sort of those green shoots of of hope yeah 100 percent. and um i think it was reflected in your research as well that 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 is happening and i see it more and more um a really important thing i think is um, what happens within the organisations about creating trust. So both Vanessa and Harriet mentioned this, and, and I don't think you can underestimate how important trust is in this dialogue, because if you don't trust your boss, if you don't trust the organisation's intentions towards you, if both of those, um, Harriet and Vanessa have also explained that you simply won't feel that you can speak up. So actually, you're much more likely to leave and take your talent with you if you don't feel that you can, you know, trust both your boss and the organisation. So um, a lot of the organisations that I work with um, bring me in to train their line managers about how to create trusting and authentic relationships and interestingly that enables you to challenge more so once you trust the employer and once they trust you you can actually have a really high challenge relationship but for me it really does start with trust and um, there's something very deep and psychological about we move towards what we get rewarded for and this is not just at work this is in life and we move away and almost deselect what we get punished for so we have to be really careful about what the most powerful person in the room does and and quite a lot of the coaching i do is about 
helping both male and female leaders to understand what they're doing um, not um, with any deliberate intent. And as you say, a lot of our biases are sort of inherent and we don't know we've got them. But it's about helping people to understand that the way they speak, the way that they um, interrupt in meetings, for example, they might be really small things, but they really matter. Um, I think absolutely what can happen, and, and certainly it's been the case recently, some um, BAME challenges um, that one of my clients has been having is you might not know the answers as a leader. So actually, if, if you're a white male, you might not know what to do. But fundamentally, what I've seen um, lots of success with is people just um, coming and finding people like myself and like clients I work with. And I work with an association called Think It Out that really helps here is come and talk about it because actually if, if this was an easy problem to solve Edwina we'd have solved it already so actually don't be embarrassed or ashamed that you don't know the answer go and talk to people and, and you know get get some of those answers from them and for women themselves I think um, I've heard lots of great stuff about mentoring and sponsorship and certainly where where I did my growing up in corporate life in hospitality is a brilliant organization that's voluntary called plan b it's all non-for-profit but it sets up mentors and senior women leaders and helps just to elevate their careers and and i think it was um vanessa said it you've got to own your own career from day one mm -hmm. so i think certainly a lot of work that i do with as a coach um, I, I do hear a, a bit of imposter syndrome, but I really help people, as, as, as your research has shown, to take charge of it. So I kind of bring my imposter along with me now for the ride. I've, I, don't, I don't expect to, to not have that because actually there's a lot of research that suggests that you've actually got to be quite smart to have imposter syndrome. So you've got to have the ability to reflect. And um, also there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which a lot of people have heard of now because it's quite often on Twitter. But um, those people who suffer the most from underestimating their talents are quite often the most able. So I'm kind of taking mine along for the ride as evidence that I'm OK, I'm probably quite smart. And actually, I've got a, a good, healthy amount of self-reflection going on. So um, the other thing, New Scientist ran a really interesting article, and it was only in August 2020, so you can probably still get it. And it was about what can you do about bias? So it's accepting that we all have it. And one of the things that they talk about is be it being safe enough to call it out. And I think that's crucial. Um, thinking about how it feels to be in other people's shoes and, um, you know, really thinking about what you can do as an individual. And I always tie that in with clients. And there's some really brilliant research that suggests that if we all did 15 minutes of reflection a day, and this is a study from Harvard, so I love quoting it because it feels really robust to me, that um, 15 minutes a day over nine weeks leads to a 23% increase in performance for some study groups that they've done. So for me, just sitting down and thinking, you know, stopping being busy, and thinking about your role in this. So for, for a woman, thinking about what's your self-talk like? What are you saying to yourself? But also being really honest with yourself about if you felt marginalised at any point, being really honest and not brushing it under the carpet, actually thinking about what you could do with it. And thinking about have you made your intentions clear enough? And I think we got some lovely advice from Harriet there. But if you're a male leader thinking about, am I making it safe to call it out? Um, how, let me think about how it's felt to be in somebody's shoes today in a meeting that I've been in and thinking about the one thing you can do, because it, it was great to hear in the research about the fact that this isn't seen as something that women are fixing for women. This is actually something that men and women are fixing for generations to come for together. each other. Absolutely. And I think that's very important. We need to just pause there, Dulcie. Um, I'm outrageously going to name drop for a moment because you triggered something in me. Can we bring everybody back up? Because we're going to have some questions, please, Becky. And I will name drop while I'm doing that. So I was very lucky a couple of years ago to meet the fabulous Oprah Winfrey. And she gave what I love as a piece of fab advice, which was, you know, she has been successful because everybody at every stage of her career underestimated what she could do. And she managed to get a contract signed based on the fact that nobody, but nobody at the studio believed she would ever build a big audience 
Ooh, I bet they're kicking themselves today. <laughs> but she, I mean, you know, underestimation, imposter syndrome, these can all be turned as forces for good. So I absolutely hear you. And, um, and I think we can learn a lot from that. Now, um, I think we're going to have some questions. I'm going to kick off with a question that was um, uh, shared with us from the lovely Vicky Foster, who's at St. James's Place. And she says, to what extent do the panel feel that being completely transparent about pay and reward across all levels will contribute to accelerating progress with the gender pay gap? And if I can, I'm going to restrict to two answers. And you can pick which question because we're going to have more. So if you want to stick your hands up, if you want to answer the question, that'd be great. Or just jump in. Oh, I can go if you like. Yeah. Um, I, I just feel really, I do feel really strongly about this, which is yes, in short. So, you know, half of the problem that we know women report is that they don't know what to ask for. And I feel that as well. Whenever I'm asking for money, I'm like, you're, you're plucking things out of thin air. You really have no idea what you should be aiming for. And I remember once sat next to a guy and we were doing essentially the same job. And he showed me a picture of the house he'd just bought. And I thought, I know. You know, I know he didn't have big stacks of cash behind him. He was doing it based on his salary multiplied, getting him a mortgage. And I was like, there's no way that my salary multiplied is getting me that mortgage. So I can now work out roughly what the difference is in our salary. And I need to go and ask for that amount. We shouldn't have to do it that way. It should be fair, honest, transparent. But that is, again, means that we have to be adults and accept that sometimes people are going to be doing the same job and earning more. People are going to be doing the same job and earning less. But the benefit of that is we know where we stand and we know what we should be asking for and where we should be going. Fantastic. I just come in too because what we found in our research when we were looking at the unentitled mindset as it was demonstrated by women who were reluctant to ask for increased pay was that if you changed the environment a little bit, I mean, this comes to Dulcie's point about how um, effective it was uh, when uh, musicians are auditioning to change the environment so you don't know who's male and who's female. In this case, it's different. You change the environment so that it's very clear what, um, uh, how to ask for something, what the possibilities of outcomes are, you treat pay negotiations as a normal part of working life so that women don't feel that they're sort of stepping out of their comfort, you know, their gender comfort zone and putting themselves forward. And when you do this, uh, it has been found, and this again came out of Harvard Kennedy School just recently, very recently published research, that when they know, you know, they're clear about the process, they're clear who to go to, that uh, women are much better at negotiating. And, um, you know, this is very important, not only to keep the uh, gender pay gap on, you know, in front of us to know what it is, but to make it more robust so that we um, have um, ethnicity gap as well, uh, maybe gaps between those who have children and those who don't. Um, and not only do we see it, but then we feed that back into the decision making process so we can reflect better on how it is we're making those decisions, um, you know, at the crucial points. Great. Really good, clear advice. Thank you so much. We have time maybe for another question. Is there something there? Lovely. What will each woman on this panel choose to challenge this month? or this year? Oh, there's a loaded question. Right, one thing. Uh, where should we start? Vanessa, let's start with you. Yeah, I think I'm going to call out, um, I'm going to choose to challenge um, people's commitments. So just to kind of, you know, last year, we had a lot of people, even when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, putting black squares, people saying that they are really behind gender equality. And I'm going to choose to challenge this year in terms of what how can we measure that what have you done what have you tracked how do we know that you are really trying to advance women in the workplace so that's my that's what I'm going to do I'm going to challenge that challenge the targets hold their feet to the fire very very good I like that Dulcie I, I've got a nice practical one so um I decided to to um 
closed my training business um, over the lockdown because I'd got no experience of online training and I've reopened it and I've really surprised myself. So there's a lesson there about, you know, telling yourself you can't do things when you can. But what I've done is I've put together a programme um, to train people to coach, but I'm deliberately going to run it in a very family friendly way. So 10 until 2, no school holidays and all online and global, because actually I think I've been as guilty as anybody of, you know, running programmes that last all day and um, getting people physically together. And actually, in the course of this research, I've realised that that's not always helpful because, um, you know, people have got lives as well. So it's not exclusively women, but it's people who've got those commitments can, can in effect, get qualified to coach, but in a way that doesn't compromise um, any flexible working arrangements that they've hopefully got. Yeah, shorter can be sweeter, absolutely. Well, um, Harriet. Um, so I think for me at the moment, I'm going to choose to challenge anyone who says that we can go back to work as normal. <laughs> um, so we can't and we shouldn't be, we should be learning from this period. But also anyone who says, uh, that's it, we've got rid of our office and we're going fully flexible now. I want to challenge and say, I don't think you've done the thinking behind that. I don't think you've planned it out and I don't think it's going to work unless you put some time and effort into it. Very wise, very wise. And of course, Terry, please, your thoughts. Well, what I want to do is take this very rich project that we've just presented and um, convey it as clearly as possible to as many people and make sure that uh, businesses know about it and that businesses can use it to focus their efforts to progress to make their efforts much more um, efficient and doable. Wonderful. They are they're great visions, great goals, and I applaud them all. And please, can I say thank you on behalf of everyone here today to our brilliant panellists who have spoken so eloquently and importantly on this subject. So thank you very much. And can I just take a few moments to also thank some of our other supporters um, behind the scenes. And these um, are some of the, you know, biggest brands, smartest minds, and it is an absolute joy to work with you and to have your um, thoughts on this particular project. So to all of these companies, all of our wonderful supporters, a huge thank you. If I can just remind people, um, this is our mission. This is our hashtag. Please do get involved. And um, if you want to, you can join us on social. It's going crazy at the moment. Very exciting. And you can also, of course, download either the full research paper um, or the recommendations report. They're on the website, which is um, thefemalelead.com. And do please um, help share the word. Thank you all. Thank you so much.